Coniston Tales, told by W.G.C., and printed and published by William Holmes, Ulverston, 1899. To the editor of Nothing Much, a monthly magazine. It was owing to your encouragement that these sketches were attempted, and it is by your help and permission that they are now reproduced from your pages. Accept, then, the dedication of our little book from your obliged contributor, W.G.C., Coniston, April, 1899. The Apology Two poets of old we know, two saga smiths today, and the one is long ago, and the other is far away. For the things of here and now, and the thoughts of now and here, they write on the wrinkled brow, in runes of an evil cheer. They bid us be up and fight, they shout to us, forth and strive, from the cockcrow on to the night, as long as we stand alive. But the old world tale says, dream of days that have long gone by, by the light of the sunrise gleam, and the glamour of memory. And over the hills is hope, and the wonder of distant things, as the stars in the telescope out glitter your diamond rings. So the cares of a weary day fall from us like springtide snow, when we gaze upon far away, or dream about long ago. End of part one. The Cairn on the Moor It was on Torver Moor I lay in the grass, and the sun was hot on my shoulders, and the heat of it scorched my cheek, and my ear tingled where it was touched by the burning. I was lying on an old cairn, stone-built and mortared with moss. The crown of the cairn was dimpled like the crown of a ripe apple, and turf and thyme crept about its foundation. Bees were busy at the time, they sailed and stopped, sailed and stopped, and the coming of them was stillness rather than sound. Then a very little breath of wind swept over the moor, and they took their ways and went. And then, down in the cairn, I heard talking, as it might be on the other side of a door. No greater gift is given of man to man, with this the tree that grows thick as thy waist is broken, and falls to hollow for a boat, or prop thy hut thatch. Give it then to my hand. Nay, listen, with this the bone thy teeth have cleaned is made as a thorn, to let out the life of beast or man. Give it, I say. Nay, here, with this the oak stub is hollowed, before one moon grows round, when red-hot stones have been nightly heaped upon it, with this thou tappest softly, so, the wild wolf's head-bone, and maybe a man's, and he is dead. It is mine. And what mine? This coat of deerskin. That is nothing. This necklace of teeth. That is little. O oh, child, hither, leave twining bark strips, and turn thy feet to me. And thou, stranger, look upon her. Fat she is, for she eats fat of deer. Red is her mouth for she drinks the blood when it is warm, and when the snow is deep, she lies by the fire and none stirs her, the best she has of all, and she is strong as a young wolf. Then I saw the stranger tramping over the moor, and the wind blew, a tall man shaggy and fierce, and after him tripped a young girl, lithe and strong, with fair skin, sunburnt and slim, ungirded waist. Black were her eyes and gleaming, and rosy her cheeks with a tear on each. Her long dark hair streamed away in the wind. On her back she carried the skin-sack of the stranger, heavy with its load, and as he went down to the ford of the gill, he turned to her, and seemed to bid her look well to her burden, but with no menace, and she looked at him with soft eyes as a dog looks. But by the low turf-thatched hut on the brow of the moor stood another man, heeding them not at all, but patting and fondling a sharp stone axe, stroking it over as if it had been a living cub of some beast of the hunt. Then he hewed at a log of wood, and the axe stuck in it. He laughed and shouted and wrested it away. Out of the hut crept a woman on hands and knees, for the door was low. She stood up and stared around and shrieked out to the man. He held up his treasure before her eyes, and she sat down, and rocked herself and tore her hair. There was talking again. It would be in the stranger's hut, a little cooing voice. 
go then and come back with the greatest book on the mountains the fire shall burn and i will make thee taste savoury meat it is thee i would eat bird soft to my hands and to my mouth sweet as honey and to-morrow to-morrow i would lie still and taste what i had eaten and the third day the third day i would set fire to rafter and thatch and go in the smoke thy bones and mine together thy flesh and mine to the stars nay now fool leave this and away to the hunting come thou with me we will hunt together and i will show thee a nest of eaglets what and who will get firewood and fetch water and pick red heather for thy filthy black hut we too afterwards by moonlight go rough bear go and be as men are am i not a woman and thy wife then it was moonlight the mist lay flat along the valley as if the waters had risen to the brink of the moor outside the hut a fire burnt and she threw sticks upon it and stones and now and then raked out a stone red hot to cast it into a great earthen pot where water was bubbling she looked over the moor other huts hard by lay silent and their fires smouldered and smoked up to the sky she looked up at the crags they were black and nothing stirred betwixt them and her the moon waded through the clouds and a red star shone in the fringe of the moon burr there was one coming over the moor in the mist she clapped her hands and ran to meet him crying out shrilly like a curlew she ran and stopped he was gone her knees shook as she came trembling back to the hut and to the sinking fire the moon was over the crags she climbed upon a hillock and looked out again there was one standing on the hillock over against her she plunged through the heather and panted up the brow but he was gone her teeth chattered as she came back to the hut and the fire was failing the moon was set now only the red star stood upon the edge of the crags she climbed again to watch the brown moor and lo one stooped at the very door of the hut stooping as if to enter he was plain to see between her and the firelight she flew down the slope and fell into the doorway no one was there and she lay by the dying fire hardly able to throw twig after twig upon it but this she must do till he came then the dawn arose and then the morning what woman is thy man away oh neighbour where is he who should know but thou i drove him out to hunt a hunting he will be but i saw him cross the moor it was a deer but i saw him stand on yon brow it was no more than a stone but i saw him come in at this door nay then get thee gone to the wise man then an old man came brown-skinned and tanned all over as if he had lain for a hundred years in a peat bog his tawny white hair hung to his waist his beard clothed him below it and the hair of his limbs was white on the brown he had a hollow cobble in his hand and over it for a lid was a lucky stone such a bit of slate with an unmade hole in it as you find on the topmost top of coniston fells he took red embers in his fingertips and set them in the hollow of the stone and white smoke curled up through the hole in the lid he crept into her hut and the door was shut upon him she sat weeping outside and her hair lay in her lap within the hut there was a stirring and harsh singing and cries they bade her ask now or never of the wise man made strong in his wisdom father where is he search where shall i turn higher dost thou see him i see him oh tell me betwixt crag and water does he stir he sleeps oh give me tokens black and white the stream falls red and white he lies she was clambering over the giant screes calling and crying aloft the cloven crags hung huge above her beneath was a black still tarn over against her rose the mountain into the cloud the screes moved under her feet that bled from sharp stones and her knees were red from rough rasping there was no answer to her cry but what the rocks gave back shouting to her all around every cranny of the great rock slide she searched 
and rubbed her eyes with torn hand and clambered forward. Then into a cliff she fell, and in her fall she clasped him. Oh, man of mine, strong man of mine, hunter of the wolf and the red deer and the roe, how have I lost thee, how have I followed thee, how have I found thee again? O oh, light of my eyes, O oh, drink of my mouth, O oh, fire of the heart in my body, where is the glance of thee, where is the breath of thee, where is the warmth of thy cold, cold breast? A great thing he gave, a little thing he got, but he took me to his dwelling, and I am his. How shall I call thee? How shall I awaken thee? The life-blood has run through the crannies of the rocks. The grey rocks have eaten thee. The sharp rocks have torn thee, as a bear, as a wolf, growling over a kid of the goats. This I know, this will I do. Be strong, my shoulders, as an oak. Be hard, my broken feet, as the stones of the crags. I will carry him back to the kinsfolk. I will build him the red sleeping place of the silent. I will lie down beside him and hold him fast, and we shall go up together. Round about the fire of the dead they stood, the wild folk of the fell, and the heather blazed up with a smothering smoke. There was a great cry, shrill as a curlew's, and a low cry, soft as a dove's, and they looked on one another and nodded with their heads. When the fire had died away, out of the embers they plucked a few bones and a handful of white ashes, and all that was left of a true heart. On the spot of the burning they left them, in a rude urn of clay. Men laid stones around and roofed their spot over with unhewn stones. Women tore their hair and beat their bosoms, keening and clamouring around the cairn on the moor. The bees sailed by to the time and stopped, and clung about the grasses. The sun stood over dow crags, and the moon was rising, soft behind the long fir woods of Monk Coniston, dreamy and warm in the evening light. It was an easy pillow for a sleeping head, that moss-grown dimpled pile and turf-invaded base of the still unviolated tomb. Ah, said I, rising, three thousand years ago, or in dreamland, such hearts may be found. But I was young then, and had many things to learn. End of part two. The Great Circle. He was father and chief of the Tykes, when the Tykes were a clan. They chanted him son of the hound, their mightiest man, in the days when the corries were ice and the summits were snow, and the valleys were smothered in birch and the levels in flow. He was master of Borren and Lith, he was lord of the moor, and he followed the hunt like a dog for his scent was as sure, with breath as unbroken, and muscle as ropey and full, and the beard and the brow of an ape, and the voice of a bull. When the boar of the swamp was at bay, it was he that ran in, when the cave-dweller bellowed and boxed, it was he took the skin, and when strangers came up through the woods, from the far-lying plain, it was he that heaved rocks at their heads till they vanished again, his desire was a law to his tribe, his saying was good, he took what he fancied of weapons, or women, or food, he gave what he wearied of, smote what he angered with, slew, foe that fled, friend that fell, child that cried, and to plead was taboo. So the creature grew heavy and fat, and at last, unaware, he was caught, he was speared, he was slain, like his brother the bear, and with wailing and faces flint scored and anointed with mud, his kinspeople buried him here where the peat drank his blood. They gave him a spear that the spirits might hunt for his meat, and a slave newly slain at his head, and a wife at his feet. And leaving him housed in the cairn, their last offering they made of a drink in a bowl and of flesh for the peace of the shade. Now wonders began, for the folk climbed hillward at morn, so it was the offering accepted or wasted in scorn, and lo, the bowl empty, the platter lay cleared on the ground, and two long grey wolves of the wood 
stretched out by the mound. He was stirring, they whispered. At night he was drunken and fed. He has smitten a stroke at the beasts, and he's back to his bed. And they prided themselves on their chief, filled platter and bowl, and abode between worship and awe for the terrible soul. So the days wore to winter, the dark outwearied the moon, and the sun setting nightly drew nearer the mark of the noon, and she that should go with the grave meal, a withered old wife, nay, she would not, let younger folk fare, she was feared of her life, she had seen, what, a wolf, well, a bear, she had heard, what, the dead, she knew not, her heart was as water, her knees failed, she fled, so a dare-devil lass cried, who fears, and forth she would go, and they found her next day by the grave, with her face in the snow. Then they trembled and whispered and pointed and fled in a fright, and they hid in their hovels and listened, and quaked through the night. But when Selendine glittered, and daisies peeped out on the grave, the dread of the dark passed away, for the spring made them brave. Till at last on an eve came one, through twilight and ways, with foam on his beard, and his eyes, yet a fire with amaze. I have seen him, he chased me, he caught me, I fought him, he cried. I wrestled, I threw him, he panted, and speaking, he died. Then the elders sat grimly in conclave, their feet to the fire, with the druid, their medicine man, in his magic attire, strange feathers and furs of creatures they dreaded the most and a snake-skin for belts and a mask would frighten a ghost he was wizard and prophet and priest and he knew what was wise when war was afoot between men and the folk of the skies so he lay on the turf and was silent and rising at last spoke out of the salve that should heal the wounds of the past there are stones on the fell, there are slabs as huge as a steer. Go find them and fetch them, ye cannot. No matter, ye hear. How lead you the bear that is slain? Ye call yourselves men, and heave with a song at the cords by ten and by ten. There are thatch ropes of hide to your roofs, go bind them around. There are rafters, go lay them beneath, that they roll on the ground. So build you a rampart of rock in a ring to the tomb that he bide in his house and leave troubling, lo, this for his doom. He was architect also, the druid. He scored out the line, and planned what none else of his age had the wit to divine. And they chanted the song of his art, as they toiled in the blaze, the art of the builder in stone, the first of his days, and the soul of the terrible dead in his grave was at rest and the nights of his people were peaceful, their mornings were blessed, and less than a little they dreamed of the alien eyes that should stare at their work with amaze in this world of the wise. End of part three Of the Mines in the Mountains, a Greek letter Written about 85 AD Note, Demetrius was a real person and so was his supposed correspondent. The tablet he dedicated to Oceanus Antithes I have seen in the museum at York. Mention of his studies in Britain is made by Plutarch. We do not know that the Coniston mines were actually worked by the Romans, though many writers have affirmed as much. Perhaps the iron mines in Low Furness were known to them, and worked even still earlier, for at Stainton, Two polished stone celts were found in the old men's workings. In many other parts of England, the Romans certainly mined and smelted, and their coins and pottery have been discovered in the heaps of slag and rubbish where they worked. End of note. Demetrius, the scribe to Ammonius, master of philosophy, health and happiness. Many a time it has come into my mind, O Ammonius, to send thee word of my latest wanderings in this isle of Britain, but the distance and the wildness of this barbarous country, and the irregularity of messengers have prevailed. But now it seems I can pay the debt, for know that I am come to the shore of the uttermost parts, 
to a haven whence to-morrow a ship will sail venturing forth like perseus winging his way from the unknown mountains of atlas committing itself like the bark of ulysses to the streams of encircling ocean in the amazing hope of revisiting iberia and the pillars of heracles and so through the happier waters of our own sea making for rome thence to delphi is as it were but a step so that even this frail wax tablet may come to thy honoured hands the master mariner to whom i spoke but now laughed at my wonderment when i asked him what chance he had of reaching port said he with fair wind and good fortune in two months or so we shall be eating grapes on the quay at ostia never a doubt saving reverence due to the nereids and i said he with a grin am no hylas but indeed a wonderful place is this little harbour ravenglass five years ago a desert of spreading sand-hills by the grey and many sounding sea or at least a village of the wildest barbarians who in frail barks of basket so they call it covered with bull's hides essay the fishery of herring and of cod yea even attack the porpoise and the seal then comes our great agricola marching through estuary and forest opening out dense ways and lightless tracks for the rays of wisdom and the arts of life to enter in with eagle eye he sees that the haven was fair being a landlocked pool where three rivers meet and a narrow opening to the hyperboreal expanse of storm note by the way that hereabouts they find pearls though such as i have seen to-night be but little and internally brownish of hue with no more than a dull gleam upon them but with a word our julius bids a camp arise and lo a town well placed defensible and for such a climate neither unfit nor uninhabitable yonder they say i saw it not one beholds the island of mona and from this port go three roads to the south to the north and to the west whereby the goods of the merchant and the sinews of war are carried on the backs of men and horses far into the heart of the land here then at the consummation of my travel through woods and wilds i am greeted by the delights of life supper not wholly uneatable being a sheldrake thought a delicacy by these natives and with it a salmon and oysters there is a roof above me fairly built a couch to lie upon and wonder of wonders a bath within a few paces of the door what is no less welcome i find converse of human beings unlike the apes of the mountains think not i mean the same breed with those of africa but creatures that are not far removed thou sayest even apes are not too mean nor too unclean for thy disciple to regard with the eye of inquiry be it so and indeed i have sought to take the measure of these gadelic monsters even to the gauging of their poor wits and the probing of their shallow ideas of things they ignorantly assert concerning the gods but the mere sound of a greek or even a roman voice cheers me after the painful solecisms of barbarous guides and the interpreted stammerings of the more uncouth mountaineers ah me have i often said as i strove to hear their various and incomprehensible babbling who shall interpret the interpreters i call them apes but in jest thou knowest i scorn them not wholly in my heart for as the roman says homo sum and so forth now wilt thou ask where have i been in what wilds among what savages finding what adventures my ammonius among the gadeli for so my apes are called and in their savagest hills mountains i know and thou knowest for do not the mountains rise behind tarsus my native town city of great men and do they not encircle thy sacred home of delphi but what is the great parnassus's self to these they call skudau and elberlin and pens and cathars and such like names innumerable in their jargon thinkest thou i compare them for their size not so for in mere altitude i reckon taurus or the heliconian summit at twice their importance thinkest thou for their prospects i smile never was sight more horrible for sheer lack of aught that may make travelling endurable for cold and wet for hunger and toil for roughness of rock and pathlessness of waste for treacherous swamp and tangled forest and above all for danger of yet unsubdued savages 
fiercer than their wolves and wild bulls for these no caucasus nor alps may be compared with that i have gone through to-day and i shake the dust nay the mud of them from my weary feet from being sent as thou knowest o ammonius by augustus domitian of whom the gods preserve to search out the resources of this island and to add unknown wealth to the glory of the empire i came to eburacum how i travelled what honourable reception i had from the governor how i laboured to approve myself worthy of his welcome teaching for a season in the schools which he greatly in my judgment hoping has founded for the better sort of barbarians all this i have written and sent by the imperial messenger to the daring seaman who pushes forth into the unknown to-morrow i entrust these less valued lines know then that agricola the governor having travelled in these parts and having sought information from the natives bade me search diligently for certain iron and copper of which tales were told i heard and obeyed by the road his centurions had made i travelled through the land of the brigantes making all haste across the less rugged but not more fertile hill country until i came to a great bay called by the britons more cam which is to say the crooked sea thence over wide wet sands thou knowest in these places the sea falls twice a day and twice comes roaring back to take up its place was it that which homer meant in saying the streams of ocean and not only the currents and whirlpools thereof i leave this by the way to thy better judgment now across the sands there is a well-known road by the coast of the Sistuntii, and where the successive estuaries of lona and canta and lebena give place to dry land the road is made over white rocks that put me in mind of the white crags of greece forgive the comparison for to an exile even the likeness of stone with stone takes the eye and these white rocks whereof i bring with me morsels are assuredly like our marble though coarser in grain being well fitted for burning to lime there is also good abundance of a tophaceous marl fit for agriculture now when i had passed the sands without mishap trusting to my guides i came to a road well made in the red earth through an undulating land and on a brow above a little valley found lodging in the station founded by our agricola footnote he seems to mean dalton in furnace End of footnote. thereabouts the rocks are red and it needed no witness to show me iron lying somewhere hidden in the limestone not to weary thee with many a day's toil i found a good oar and marked the spots showing my tables of authority to the prefect i bade him set men to work digging it in places better and more profitable than those where the ignorant natives had scratched the soil with rude stone tools smelting the red ore in ruder hearths thence after repose seven days ago it seems a month of nights i set forth hearing that copper was found in the mountains my heart failed me to venture into those trackless wilds but duty and the service i owe impelled me to risk my life for am i not as it were the soldier of philosophy therefore i set forth with a good company and well armed given me by the prefect under a centurion responsible for my safe conduct to whom was added a ragged crew of aborigines who partly for fear and slavish awe and partly tempted by promises for agricola's comity has taught me to deal friendly even with these apes had taken oath on all they held sacred of which more hereafter to show me where copper might be for thou mayest believe to seek mines in these mountains be a man ever so expert is seeking knots in a rush without he have some forewarning of their place in a little while we left the plain if plain it be called being but the shelf of shore along another estuary forgive the comparison again but i held it not unlike the coasts of thy home in that mountains stand over against mountains with inlets of the sea between then we struck into the wilderness and forced our way through woods of oak and beech the olive is unknown in this region nor does the cypress grow though the juniper is as it were a mockery of it and we passed over tracts of heather which wonderful to relate blooms even here it's gladdened me to breathe its well-remembered fragrance much club moss is found on the hills and plucked by our britons for charms 
according to their religion. Before us were ever the distant mountains, purple on the afternoon sky. The multitude of birds astonished me. Of lesser kinds were flights innumerable. But what thou wouldst admire is the wild peacock of the north, a great bird of many colours that makes its nest in these moors. Footnote. The Capicale. End of footnote. At evening, so wearied was I, for I could not always ride on my horse, the ways being far too rough, and I often rode on the back of an unsavoury gadolus. Pity me, Ammonius. So wearied was I, that I fell supine upon the heather which they gathered for my couch, and so continued until the sun was high. That day I came to a lake, long and narrow, embosomed in the wooded hills. Here the freshwater fishery might be to some profit, if ever men were brought to live so far away from the world. But who can dwell in such a place, even to eat fresh trout? Upon heathery wastes I did indeed see huts of the gadeli, and smoke arising. I bade my men catch one of these same apes, that I might see whether he had the form of humanity, and one they caught asleep in his lair. He blinked at me from under a shaggy red thatch of matted hair, and truly, though thou mayest exclaim and doubt, he might have passed, were he washed and combed, for one of those red Galatians, long-limbed and barbarous of aspect, whom I have seen come down to Tarsus. But he would answer no word to all questions, and my men, being used to such cattle, began to twist his arms and chastise him, that he should speak. But I, more humane, as becomes thy disciple, and a follower of our Julius, bade them somewhat sharply to desist, on which released he was gone in the twinkling of an eye, skipping among the tall bushes of heather, and hardly discernible at the distance of a stone's throw. One of my men, recovering himself, did indeed sling a bullet after him, but it seemed to fail of the mark, for which the centurion smote him down, and promised discipline to those that had let the ape go free. Thou mightest say, my master, that they were not wholly to blame. I will bear it in mind, if indeed punishment be not already meted out. And yet in these wilds there is little time for ethical disputations and the nice balancing of motives, as we use in the schools. The soul of a man deserts his head, and seems to travel to the finger-joints of his right hand, which, being prompt, has a justice of its own in this land of Britain. So thus I came into the very heart of the mountains, beside a roaring stream that led into a dell exceeding narrow. I passed therein with fear and trembling, for the rocks were high above my head, and great stones lay around, but lately fallen and shattered. By the mercy of the gods we came through, but only to find rocks still more frightful and dangerous, reaching to the sky all around, and great waterfalls hanging from them, and clouds covering their tops. Who knows how lofty and threatening! I put up a prayer to the deities of the place, and to the genius of Augustus, as well I might, and took heart somewhat, for true it is, in spite of doubting, that holy beings dwell in these sacred recesses. Have I not felt their awe? Even my soldiers, nay, even the apes themselves, believe it, held breath and seemed to fear. Now the rock of these mountains is black, and in places I found, for we spent the night even there, certain pillars of stones hexagonal, such as are seen only in land near a burning mountain, for such is my experience. Seeing which, I inquired if fire had ever been known to burst from the earth. They assured me that no such thing was in any old stories or songs of the people, and yet there are great craters in these hills, like that of Vesuvius, sometimes filled with water, which might seem to have quenched the native fire. Footnote. It was clever of him to notice this, but he was quite mistaken, as every schoolboy knows nowadays. End of footnote. And yet thou knowest how Vesuvius, so long quiet, burst forth but five years ago, and with what terrible consequences. I braved every danger, and confident in my mission, and the protection of the gods, explored the uttermost cranny of this Tartarian gulf. It is in these crannies that copper is found, a white streak of hard stone sparkling like alabaster, and a glimmer as of gold in it, or a streak of soft red earth in the solid rock, 
stained with green spots, betrays the metal. Some little holes have been dug here and there by the natives, but as before, the best places were untouched. These I noted, and the manner of finding them again, and shortly, fortune favouring, shall send men to open out mines, and with due authority to work them for copper. But the lamp burns low, my sailor snores at the door, waiting this hour for the letter I scribble hastily. The tablets will hold no more than must suffice to tell thee how, after a day's journey through hills even as frightful, I came to a fort on a steep, lofty tongue of land in the midst of the mountains, where the builders are still at work. Footnote. Hardknot Castle, of course. End of footnote. There I was well received, and resting for one night, travelled more easily by a road even now in making, through a valley unspeakably hideous and wild, beside a river, whereof, when I asked the name, they could tell nothing but usk or esk, which is no more than to say water, such is the state of these barbarians. And now, after short repose, I must again venture forth into these mountains, for I hear talk of still richer mines in them. May Oceanus Antithis, whom I here behold face to face under the stars, send me safe into civilised regions. May all good gods be with thee. Farewell. Salute the young Plutarch for me, and tell him that I, who laughed once, follow him now, in carrying tablets with me, and noting all new things in the moment of seeing them. End of Part 4 The Three Godmothers In days of yore, on a morn in Yule, there were folk at a christening. The priest was robed, and the stoop was filled, for the child of the Angle King. The child was born at the murk midnight, and lapped in the snow-white lawn, and holden forth from bower to kirk before the break of dawn. Now who stand out to speak the word, and stead him at the font, and who shall be his godmother, as Christian folk are wont? And lo, beside the holy step, three ladies standing fair, raven locks and chestnut curls, and she with the golden hair, raven hair with the purple robe, and chestnut curls with the plaid, and goldilocks with the great white limbs, and the bare skin, and the blade. Now take the child, and make the pledge, and vow the gossip vow. They lifted a hand to the stars above, and laid it on his brow. And raven hair, she gave him a gift, that was a kingly wand. And chestnut curls, she gave him a gift, the harp was in her hand. And goldilocks, she gave him a gift, and a smile was on her lip when his little red hand shut hard and fast on the tiller of a ship. Now who be these that none saw come, and none have seen depart? Were these thy saints, O priest from heaven, or whites of wizard art? Nay, neither saints, O king, from heaven, nor whites of wicked birth, but the greatest of all the powers that be, and dwell in middle earth. For one was queen of the south country, and one of the western realm, and one was queen of the northern coasts that bear the long ship's helm, and she that gave a golden rod she has given the ruler's dower to hold the world in weal and peace with the heritage of power, and she that gave the corded harp she has given a secret spell to call the tears to an angel's eyes and a smile to souls in hell, and she that gave the tiller haft she has given a heart of oak to drive the horses of the storm in the sturdy sea-king's yoke. The king laughed out for very pride, and snapped his thumb in glee, but the priest looked forth to the rising sun, and he signed with his fingers three. Hail to thee, child of the Angle folk, and the gifts that the world has given. Wield them and prosper, till thou forget the gift I have brought thee is greater yet, the cross of thy Lord in heaven. End of part five. A miracle of St. Cuthbert, about 680 AD. There is neither history nor legend of St. Cuthbert at Coniston. The whole story is a might have been, but there is nothing in it that might not have been, and Reginald of Durham might have written it somewhat as follows. 
hic incapits miraculum quod beatus cuthbertus in cuplandia est operatus of that holy man cuthbert pleasant and profitable it is to read and though the pen refuses to set down all the journeyings he made and the words he spoke and the wonderful actions he performed and many are perforce omitted from the tale of the reckoning yet it is not ungrateful to add one other to the chapters of his life as it has been recounted to us by scribes of old time for whereas cuthbert was made bishop over the land of the cumbrians after that king edgefrith had subdued them to his arms it so happened that the pious monarch impelled by divine desires gave into the hand of the holy man all that country which is called cartmel with such britons as dwelt therein to hold in his free possession for aliment and for comfort in his many journeyings when the office and work of his ministry called him hither and thither now being at the city of carlisle it was borne in upon him to visit this new possession and to set it in order spiritually no less than temporally and on the way to confirm the churches exhorting the faithful rousing the sluggards and compelling all to the faithful following of their high calling therefore setting forth with those who never were absent from him night or day he passed through the wood of the english until he came to the mountains where on an island in a remote lake dwelt his dear friend herbert in hermitage having visited him and held communion with him the holy man took his way fearless through the valleys of the rugged hills and untenanted rocks by a path nigh obliterated of ancient times going ever southward through the forest of coupland for by this road his guides the shepherds of the mountains assured him he might the soonest come into cartmel and traversing a great valley and thereafter hills of no small terror and difficulty he came at last to a hidden place among lofty rocks where beside a lake of water copper is digged in the bowels of the earth and because this working of metals belongs by right to the king and is done at his command under officers appointed by him the place is named kuningus tune that is the town or village of the king in this place among rude people of the mines and certain welsh who tended a few sheep and goats upon the greener pastures of the desert hills there was a church in those days of no great size or beauty being but the inartificial building of the priest who tenanted it for he was an irishman and one of that sect and heresy with which even the blessed cuthbert himself being infect in his extreme youth and ignorance did afterwards forsake and under the guidance of holy church combat and overcome and utterly extirpate from all the territory of the english it was but some five-and-twenty years before that Bega the abbess had built the house of nuns on the promontory that by the british is called baruth that is the red headland being come over from ireland with her following to spread the gospel in these deserts nor is she that beggar of hackness of whom bede makes mention as some do vainly imagine but another who from her house of st bees as the folk of the place call it sent forth one and another into the mountains to shepherd the flock of the lord and to lead wild goats of the hills as lambs to the fold yet even so her followers were uninstructed in the truth as it is taught to us baptizing with but one immersion and shaving the hair across the forehead as the irish used and keeping the paschal feast with vitiated calendar at uncanonical time and season though earnest with all in their manner and learned in the scriptures and holy arts this poor man then being come through the wilds to the aforesaid place built there his cell of wattle and daubing as some maintain though others will have it of stones plucked from the rough ground and rudely piled together in the form of a round hut no fitting temple but such as he had ability to raise at the ford where the track through the forest passed over the brook flowing down from the copper mines into the marshland which lies wet and slimy between the foot of the crags and the water of the lake hard by were the cots of the miners and supereminent above them the house of the reeve set over them by the king these folk the priest had in some measure induced to outward semblance of respect to holy days and the services of the church but by long continuance amongst them and partaking of their uncivil ways 
not being under obedience to canonical commands, he had, as it were, fallen asleep with none to awaken him. And so, when Cuthbert the holy man, hungered and weary with much travel, approached, he beheld this poor man sitting thus at the door of the cell that was his church, bearded unseemly and unbefittingly attired, while through rents in the walls things sacred were revealed to eyes profane, and the unthatched roof let in the droppings of birds who nested thereupon to fall over the very altar, which seeing, Cuthbert was moved to anger and compassion, saying, O dog of the Lord, why slumberest thou? Art thou then indeed one of those dumb dogs of whom it is written that they cannot bark? Arise, and let thy voice be heard. Call thy flock together, for the morrow that I may salve them. And this being spoken in the tongue of the Irish, which Cuthbert knew right well, roused the poor man, who blinked upon him, and brought forth his bell, which was, as it were, an iron pot with a stone hanging therein by a rope of bark, and he began to rattle it. But none answered, for it was of a Saturday at evening, and all were in like manner ensnared with carnal feasting and sodden with ale. Then the blessed Cuthbert sighed in spirit, and went from house to house, seeking for himself and his men where to lay their heads. But none received him, for even the reeve said churlishly that he would have naught to do with strangers, be they who they might. So they came to the last cots in the village, and there was a very mean house, and a poor widow sitting at the door of it, who, seeing the man of God, rose up and made obeisance. Now Cuthbert was tall of stature, of a long face and ruddy, but meagre with fasting, and yet of a countenance most benign and shining as the sun, and his eyes were as bright as stars, and the thick brows that hung over them grey and bushy, and the bones of his brows were great, and stood forward under the sloping field of his forehead. Upon his head he wore a lofty mitre glistening with crystal, and in his hand was the pastoral staff set with many pearls, and upon his robes were orphreys embroidered with thread of gold. Seeing this poor widow, he blessed her and her house, and she bade him enter, for that such as she had was at his service. Within the house, which was rudely framed of wattled boughs and thatched with broom, there was scant space for that company even to stand, and one of the disciples plucked the bishop by the sleeve, bidding him in a whisper beware of the foulness and contamination of so mean a dwelling. But Cuthbert smiled, and penetrating the darkness with his keen glance, beheld upon a bed of heather in the corner two children lying, the one a lad of tender years and the other a babe. Their mother prayed him to forgive their incapacity, for, said she, the lad has lamed himself in the mines where his father was killed a year ago, and the babe is sick, and there is no one can heal it. Now of all men whose name has come to our understanding, this holy Cuthbert was most like to our Lord and Saviour in this, that he loved little children, and was good to them, and none of his company wondered when he sat down, and taking the babe in his arms, kissed it and blessed it, and it looked up to him and laughed, and in that hour the sickness was abated. And then he did in like manner to the lad, touching him and stroking his hurt, so that in a little while the pain went out of his limbs, and he stood up and was utterly healed. Then came running the daughter of the woman with a vessel in her hand, and it was empty, for she had gone to find milk for the children, but none would give to her, and so she returned weeping. But Cuthbert laid his hand on her head, and blessed her, and bade her go to the well and draw water, and lo, when she poured it was sweet as milk to the taste, and as new milk with the cream therein, so that this well was reckoned a holy well, after that Cuthbert had done this miracle. And sitting down, some in the house and some at the door, the men drew from their wallets the crust that remained, and they supped together, they and their hosts, and never was merrier supper, nor better fare, when the holy man had blessed it. Now when morning was come, the noise of these doings had gone forth, and a great company was awaiting the bishop, of these who overnight had despised and rejected him. First he went to the little church, and there did service in right order. Then, 
standing in the door he spoke to the people with that eloquence and divine persuasiveness which many a time softened stony hearts in the recesses of ladonian hills and overawed the proud in the halls of northumbrian lords and wealthy men and the satraps of the king and when he had done speaking they all with one consent lifted up their voices these kneeling to him and those lifting up rough hands to heaven as if moved by i know not what heavenly inspiration some brought wood and timber others axes and saws yea even the children plucked broom for roofing and in an incredibly brief space of time the reeve leading the way and labouring among them having laid aside his cloak and trappings of dignity the posts of a new and greater edifice were sunk in the earth and the frame as it were of a fair church and house of assembly for all them of the village was marked out for a while the priest stood by as one bewildered and then in faltering words what do ye my brethren he cried and ye romans in this labour on the lord's day in which it is not lawful to do any manner of work but the blessed cuthbert looked smilingly upon him saying rebuke them not for the sabbath was made for man and not man for the sabbath this is a work of mercy and of necessity it is a gladness and no labour to build the lord's house on the lord's day and with that the priest himself as if smitten with the contagion of fervour threw down his encumbering garment at the bishop's feet and fell to hailing and dragging of timber until the sweat dripped from his temples so cheerfully they wrought that by sunset the new house was roofed and if not wholly finished nor a work of perfect architecture still serviceable and ready to be consecrated the which was done before the blessed cuthbert took his ways and went on his journey to the region of cartmel now this is accounted the greatest miracle which saint cuthbert did in the land for to heal the sick is a great work and to turn water into wine is a wonderful thing but no man by human wit and science alone could impart to sordid souls the greatest of all spiritual gifts as then when by divine grace and the working of heavenly might he made churls charitable end of part six the bow in the cloud the floods were out at coniston and round the waterhead on road and meadow hour by hour the rising water spread it rained as it had never rained it stormed at each alarm the creaking fir tree mopped and mowed and waved a threatening arm and Udale crags were out of sight it was so thick that day only their falls like lightning forks glared white upon the grey then baby from the window-sill peered out into the gloom with anxious eyes as one who waits the very crack of doom what is it then my little one come down the mother said you'll scare yourself for older folk had cause to feel afraid oh mother let me stay a while the storm will soon be done i'll tell you when the rainbow comes you know there will be one yes differences must be while men dwell on the outer form there must be strife while flesh is weak and blood is quick and warm the only peace the only truth is that primeval faith that holds the promises of good that looks for rainbow after flood and glory after death end of part seven the story of thurston at the thwaite the division of high furness was made in the reign of henry the second in the days of abbot john cantsfield dolphin of kirby and the rest as well as the two monks are historical characters all except the family at the thwaite which place nevertheless may have been a norse settlement probably the first norse farmstead in our immediate neighbourhood it is true that no sagas were ever written here but there must have been tales told by the northmen's descendants which had they been written down would have fallen more or less into saga form thus chapter one of the folk that dwell there thurston hight a man he was swainson swain was thurston's son and their forelder was swain the son of thurston of the mere he dwelt at the thwaite 
that is, at Conningstoon, in the land of Horgan, by the side of the mere that was his mere. He was a stout man, and a strong man of his hands, but elderly, and stirred out little from his fields down bank along the waterhead, and the garths on the how aback of his hall. For he saw the way things were going, and liked it not, being a man of the old sort, and not given to change. Most of all he hated King Stephen, though he had little love for King Henry that was, but ever a good word for the King of Scots, that had been reckoned overlord of these parts in his young days, and let folk be, with no talk of stirring old use and want. Now the old use in these parts was that every man was his own man, and no king's man whosoever. Thurston wedded Gunhild, she was Orm's daughter of Kirby, nigh Girlworth, but she was dead, their son was Swain, and their daughter was Ingeborg. Swain was a good farmer, but this grieved Thurston, that his son should be ever after new-fangled ways in farming. CHAPTER Two, HOW THE KENTSDALE MEN CAME Now it was a day when men came to the Thwaite, and asked guesting. None said nay, for many passed by that road, what with thing-men going to Little Langdale, what with Cooper lads and chapmen, there would never be a two months' time but new faces came by, and all were welcome. So when they had bite and sup, says the head man of them, Well, I know thee, Master Thurston, by name, and better would I know thee by nature. With that, says he, sitting easily in his high seat, Little is there to know but what there is to see. I am an old man in the old spot. Well, says the other, there is one I serve would be thy friend. Good friends, said he, are always good finding. True, says he, and this is a good friend and a bad foe. I like him the better, says Thurston at the Thwaite. They call him William of Lancaster, the other went on. I like him the worse, says Thurston in his beard. Splendor Dex, says the stranger, but thou must like him or lump him. And who art thou thrall of him they call Baron, to come napping French at me. Now this was Bernard the forester, and with him was his brother William, and they had a half score of men with them, and they leaped up and rattled the arrows in their quivers. Peace, lads, cried Thurston, I bide no durdoms in my hall. Sit ye down and sup manly. Are ye slockened? Then come with me, and I will show ye somewhat. With that he took his great holling staff, and went forth of the door, going stiffly because of his age, and of the sickness that was in his knee-joints, and led them up to his how, a back of the hall, and bade them to stand in the garth that was atop of the how, when you come out of the wood on the how side. Look ye well, said he, waving the hollin wand around, so that they backed somewhat. Look ye well, and see yon garths and fields, folds and cots, and the reek rising from the hall of the thwaite. All this land, said he, thrusting the wand into the ground, all this land my four elders took, when it was no man's land. All this land they cleared and digged and ploughed and tilled. All yon cots they built for their thralls, and yon hall for themselves and their children. Two hundred winters they have lived on this spot, and I hold it now. Go back to your lord that calls himself a Northman, and tell him this. If Northman he be, a Northman's hand he shall have. If Frenchman he be, my old knees are none so lish as they were. And so the men went back to Kentdale, very ill-pleased. But as for the baron, men say he laughed at that word, and was loath to take it ill. CHAPTER Three, HOW TWO MONKS CAME TO THE THWAITE Now it was another day, and two monks came to that gate. They were clothed all in woollen, and wore white kirtles that were long to the feet, and hoods and white scarves they called scapulary, and over all, for the weather was cold by now, black gowns to wrap them in. Also they had boots, but gloves they wore none, and the thralls gaped at them. But Thurston gave them a seat, and they broke bread, but flesh-meat they would not so much as look at. Nevertheless they might drink ale, and they drank it, but not much. So when they were fed, they began to open out their business, and it seemed that one was Brother William of Leeds, he who afterwards was cellarer in the Abbey of St. Mary's, 
and the other was Brother William of Lonsdale. Why, says Master Thurston, it rains Williams nowadays, but no harm, says he, since we like a sup of wet, and get it, says the monk, and thrive on it, says Thurston, for, says the monk, he sendeth it on the evil and the good. So I have heard tell, says Thurston, maybe you think us heathens, but many's the time that word has been flung at my head by Father John there, when we have had our little strifes. Easily settled, Father John, easily settled, man, are they not? It is well, said the monk, for we of Holy Church love a man of worth that bows his neck to the yoke that is easy and light, and in that hope we come. What now? says Thurston to the alehorn, as it were. Our Lord Abbot and our house of St. Mary in Furness, by the grant of King Stephen of blessed memory, whom God forgive, says the old one. It is well, says the monk, for all men need it, and the prayer becomes all that can say it. But as I am bidden tell thee, our Lord, knowing thee to be a true son of the church, though as yet lacking, we all lack, my good sir, somewhat of perfection, our Lord would have thee know that by such kingly grant this land is in his holding. It was never a king's to give, broke forth Master Thurston. Hear me, my good master, and hear a friend friendly wise. Our Lord Abbot is loath to use violence, as violent men of the world use. There be those yonder, he went on, waving his hand to the morning ward, would think no more of roof-burning and throat-cutting than of smoking a wolf out of his earth. Now of all such our men be free, for who dare touch the lands of holy church? Many, ay, and thy own kin, they of Kirby have come in to us, and what ask we of them? Burdens, gifts, shames? Nay, it is honour we show them, gifts we give them. Their burdens, as the apostle bids, we bear. Ask Master Dolphin, thy brother, ask Orm, or any of the holders of the Southlands, and be guided. But for all answer looked Master Thurston across the hall, and through the reek of the hearth, as one in dream, and then, slapping his right hand upon the arm of his seat, said he, See ye this old settle, heart of oak it is, and black with eld, see ye yon rafters and balks, such blue they be, and even yet sound as a bell. See ye the smoke going up, for two hundreds of winters never has the spark died out on the hearth. Holy church we reverence, lords we love not, thralls we are not, and sooner than follow young nithings to their shame, I would see the roof of my father's in a low, and lie like a blue coal among the ashes. So the monks went home, and told the abbot, and he took it badly enough. Chapter 4. How Thurston's house was divided. So matters went on, for that winter, and no stir was made, for if the abbot came in with force, then he would have the baron against him and if the baron sent his men against the folk of the fells, then the abbots would complain of him to the king. But they went to work nevertheless, by words and promises and threats, to bend the holders to their side, and so get what they wanted. For it is said, possession is nine points of the law. And in a while Swain Thurstonson says he is bidden to Kentdale to guest with the baron there, and with much grumbling from his father, off he goes in his best clothes, and back he came, boasting of the friendliness of my lord, and the kindness of my lady, and the new ways of hunting, and the weapons he had seen, until his old father bade him hold his peace for a fool, and then must Ingeberg away to the abbey for what Father John called a pilgrimage for the good of her soul, and will he nil he, Thurston must give her horse and horseman to ride withal, and back she came, chattering like a jay of the fair great houses of the monks, and their chapel so rich with carven work and gold and gems, and the singing of the choir, and the preaching of one that spoke to the heart, and the goodness of all the holy men and their sufferings at the hands of worldly folk. Like me, growls Thurston at the thwaite. And so he abode like one betwixt two fires, or a balk of timber men are bringing to a house-building, when the oxen are unruly and pull two ways at once. Chapter 5. Doings at the Thing Now midsummer was come, and men rode to the thing, as of old use and wont. 
for matters of the countryside were still talked over at the old spot in Little Langdale, and folk met there year by year for their sports and their speaking. However, it were of little avail, and this time it was said that there would be talk of this new business, namely the business of the abbot and the baron, and their striving for the fell country. So thither rides Thurston at the Thwaite with his men, and there he finds his kinsmen, Dolphin and Ulf of Kirby, and Orm of Ograve, and Aylward of Broughton, and Gil Michael of Merton, and Orm Bernalfson of Urswick, and Seward and Kettle, and others of the old stock, such had gone under the abbot, because they lived near at hand to him, and feared the church, and saw what was coming. But with these old Thurston would have naught to do, and when they spoke friendly he passed them by, and when the business was opened, they spoke for the abbot and praised his rule and their lot, and threatened all gainsayers with the ban of the church, and house-burning and manslaying. Then spoke up the men out of Westmoreland from Ambleside Way, and Bronolf's head and Kentdale and the Leith, and they were for the baron, bidding the fell folk think on his might and wealth. For, said they, he could crush the whole tale of them as a lad cracks a nut in his teeth. And then the old man held up his hand to speak. He was tottering with eld and with wrath, and the words clove to his tongue, and he stood there white and angry, being a laughing-stock to all. But before speech could come on him, there was thrusting among the crowd, and into it pressed a little man in a long gown, swordless and beardless. But behind him was a company of billmen and bowmen, no folk of the fells, and around and about the thingstead rode a many men on great horses, mailed and helmed with long spears and painted shields, and one of them bare a banner, and it was the banner of King Henry. And the little man, going boldly up, stood on the mount, and cried out shrilly, as one who speaks a strange tongue, and mockingly, as one who has his foe at his foot. And he said, By your leave, good men and liege men all, by the leave of this good company, whatsoever it calls itself, the king speaks, hear the word of the king. And so he fell to reading off a scroll in Latin, and setting it out in English bit by bit, as a lad does with his grammar task. Henricus, Henry, Dei Gratia, by the grace of God, Rex Anglia, King of England, and so forth and so forth. Sciatis omnes, know ye all, ad quos, to whom, presentes literae, these present letters, pervenerint, may come, and so forth. In Speximus Cartam, we have seen the charter. Friends, by your leave, I preterm it to the Latin, which is here for your learned inspection, and come to the business in plain terms. The king saith, he confirms the grant of Stephen, Earl of Bologna, and Mortania, and late King of England, to the abbots and monks of St. Mary in Furness, giving them all his forest of Furness and Wagony, and so forth and so forth. Likewise our Lord the King hath seen, and does hereby confirm the grant from the honour of Westmoreland to William of Lancaster, of the barony of Kentdale, and so forth. And whereas a certain land or lands, being forest and debatable ground, is or are in dispute betwixt the two, namely the Abbey of Furness, and the barony of Kentdale, and whereas for the better holding of the king's peace, and the settlement of this realm, it is reasonable and proper that such dispute should be determined. Now therefore the king commands and ordains that thirty good men and true, being well acquainted with such land or lands, namely the lands in dispute between the abbey of St. Mary's in Furness, and the barony of Kentdale, do appear before commissioners as hereby constituted, and hereinafter appointed and there and then make oath that they will truly and justly and equally survey, apportion, and divide the land or lands in the dispute here before mentioned, and that such division being made and determined, the parties thereto are hereby summoned. What says the chattering con in a tongue a man may hear? quoth Thurston to his son. Thus much I gather that they have netted the boar, and will forthwith flay him, and when folk saw a young man leading an old one, they made way, seeing that he was sick to death. CHAPTER six, OF THE WITHSTANDING IN Newdale BECK 
Thurston at the Thwaite sat on his how that is a back of his hall, in the garth that is now on the how, as you come out of the woods on the how side. Thurston sat there on a rig of stone that comes up out of the turf, and the stone is a blue stone, but is waved in the bait like sand of the sea strand, and that stone is there to this day. Thurston had let do on him his sword that was his father's, and his father's father's sword before him, and he loosened the strings from the sheath and laid it athwart his knees, and no man spoke to him. In Newdale all was still, but about noontide when the sun was bright there was a flickering in the trees of Udale, where Udale Beck comes out from betwixt Raven Crag and Udale Crag, and in a while a company of people was seen, some afoot, some a horse, coming down the beck bottom as it were, down a road. Now these were the company of the thirty men who had taken oath to divide the land of the fells according to the bidding of Henry, and their dividing was on the wise. First they compassed the country round about, beginning even from Little Langdale, and going by the broad water that is Brathay to the head of Winandermere, and thence by Leven to Greenod, and then they made the boundary from the Thingstead to Renshaws, and so down the Duddon to Broughton and the Sands. And lastly they halved the land, so marked out, for they came beating the bounds from the Brathay to Tillsburg Thwaite, and from Tillsburg Thwaite down Udale Beck, and so to the head of Thurston's Water, and down the farther shore of Thurston's Water to Crake. But by now they were come into Udale, and the array of their company was seen flashing and moving in the noonday sunlight, in the dale betwixt the crags and the woods, wherein the tarns are, which, when the old man saw, he stood up, and held his sword in his right hand, and passing out of the garth door, he went slowly down the hill that was his how, and stood in the beck that was his beck, wading knee-deep in the brown water, and standing there so still, that the trout nestled and nosed against his knees, when suddenly, by a bend of the river, the foremost of the thirty sworn men came in sight, and it was Dolphin of Kirby, who knowing that land right well, was the guide and leader in their wayfaring, and he was the brother of Thurston's wife, whom, when Thurston saw, he bade him stand and asked him by what right he thus entered his land, with men not unarmed. Brother, said he. No, brother, cried the old man. I know thee not, if thou be not that niffing of the Northmen, that thrall of the monks, that betrayer of thy kin. Peace, old man, cried they all, and let the king's warrant pass. Fiend take ye all, shrieked the old man, and his eyes were flashing and his face trembling. Foul fall your king, and you, ye dastards, niffings all. And he spat upon them, and heaved up his brand to fall upon the foremost, crying out with a great cry. But even in that cry he fell, and lay there, flat in the water, and when men stooped to lift him up, there was no life in him. CHAPTER Seven, BURYING OF THURSTON After that went Swain Thurstonson to Dalton, to speak with the priest there of the burying of his father that was dead, for folk of these parts must go even so far to get Kirk burial. But the priest, he was brother to the abbot of Furness, said that one who had fallen in resisting the church and the king's men, and with ill words in his mouth, should have no Christian burial at his hands. And so they buried him on his how, and poor folk wept for him, and so ends the story. End of part eight. The Ballad of Young Beaumont In the time of Edward the Third, Sir John Elland, sheriff in Yorkshire, attacked Quornby Hall, and slew Sir Robert Beaumont. His two boys and widow went to Townley in Lancashire, and Brereton in Cheshire, where they lived until the lads were grown up. Then, with young William Lockwood, son of another victim of Elland, they met Lacey, Dawson and Hay, at Cromwell Bottom, near Brighouse, and killed Elland, after which they fled to Furness Fells, 1346. In or about 1363 they returned to Yorkshire, and tried to recover their patrimony, 
but were set upon by the people and slain. In 1346, the Fleming of Coniston was Sir John, who was succeeded in 1353 by his elder son, Richard. The ballad is such as would give the tradition of our local Robin Hood, after some generations had blurred and confused it. In 1350 to 1360, there was probably no park, though there were deer. There were no tall chimneys, though there was a Coniston Hall, and it is not certain what was the age of the spring's bloomery, though I think it may have been in working about the time of the story. When grass was green and shores were sheen, young Adam of Beaumont's gone to hunt the roe and the fallow doe in the park of Cunningston. For he has slain the proud Elland that did his father quell, and he has fled with his merry men all to the woods of Furness Fell. There's Adam and his younger brother, and Lacey and Lockwood's will, and Dawson Tough and Hay of the Clough that the sheriff's life did spill. And they have ta'en to the Furness Fells their outlawry to bide, but little they reck of the outlaw's doom, and little their deeds they hide. In Satterthwaite they house them, in a safe and sure bigging, all for to drive the abbot's deer, and the deer of the proud Fleming. So now, when dew was white on grass, or ever the morn was red, they tripped so light o'er Grisdale moor, and turned the water-head, and the Granger woke as he heard them pass, and cuddled him closer in bed. Fowl and folk were sound asleep, Tuft and town were dark, And Coniston Hall was steeked and still When they break into Coniston Park. Swiftly ran the good greyhound, And sharply twanged the bow, And for every flight the arrow flew, A heart was lying alow. Come, big we hear a bright bonfire, And brittle a heart a grease. Hold now your hand, my brethren dear, And break your fast in peace. Here's venison steaks would feast a duke, and drink that never will fail. It is my proper tap, quoth he, for they call it Adam's ale. Sir John he waked, and Sir John he winked. Is the lathe a fire? quoth he. Nay, nay, Sir John, tis a pitstead reeks. Lay quiet, said his lady. Dickon looked out, the young Fleming, and Robin looked out, his fear, and as they stood at the grey garth yet, a laugh on the breeze they hear. The woodland thieves are breaking our park and taking our fallow deer. Forth they went with their miney. They were six men and a score. Now will ye fight or will ye flee? For we be twenty more. Adam he drew a good yew bow and Will and his fellows all. But a score still stood in a lawn of the wood, though six of the foe should fall. A boat, a boat, cried young Lacey. And a boat, cried Wily Will. Now stand ye rogues, cried Robin and Dick. We'll be up sides with ye still. By thirst and water there's a spot. Ye'll ken the springs for sure. Where smithy folk should land a boat. For leading of the yore. Cut her adrift, lads, Adam he cried. I'll hold them while ye board. But even as she took the water away, He's fallen on the lairy sward. A rescue, a rescue, cried they then and backed upon the oar. But up there came the Fleming's men, and he's down beneath a score. Now fare ye well, my merry men all, farewell to the morrow's morn. We'll stop thy false tongue, Dickon he growled, and gagged his mouth in scorn. Sir John sat on his high har seat. Now fetch the rascal here, to be judged for shooting of my men, and for slaughtering of my deer. For these two deeds that thou hast done is each a felony, so think to-night upon thy sins, and to-morrow on the hangman's tree. The gag was rugging at his teeth, his hands and feet were fast, and beards wagged all in Coniston Hall, for they tain the thief at last. And never a soul would rue the morn, but one, her name I'll tell, that was the lady's bower maiden, and they called her Kirsty Bell. It was Kirsty here and Kirsty there, and Kirsty, fill for me. But I, as he sat on the Russian floor, he followed her with an E. So light of foot, so fair of face, and a look so soft and kind. And oh, thinks he, could I win me forth, she never should bide behind. 
Sir John was merry, the lady laughed, and Dickon and Rob gan sing. Lass, take yon knave a sup of ale, for a health to our lord the king. It will put him in heart to play his part on the morn, says the proud Fleming. How can he speak if his mouth be stopped? says Dick. Take out the gag. How can he stand if his feet be fast? says Rob. Then let them wag. How can he drink if his hands be tied? Why so? says Kirsty Bell, and sned the cord with a carving knife, or ever the shouting fell. The bicker was in his left hand, and the whittle was in his right. Here's to the king, cried Adam Beaumont, and the lads I'll meet tonight. Oh, when folk were fain to flee, when they saw yon whittle shine, but their feet were all in a snarl with ale, and their eyes were mazed with wine. And man, there was a durdom, or ever they cleared the hall, there were folk aneath the table-board, and up the chimney tall. Away, away, my bonny lad, it is no time to lake, but will ye gree and flit with me, and never a step I take. He clipped her up betwixt his arms, as a shepherd carries a lamb, and there afloat in the little cock-boat, the bainest gate for ham. And while she'd laugh, and while she'd greet, and the stars shone bright aboon, and ay, but life and love were sweet, by the light of a hunter's moon. End of part nine. The Hermit of Monk Coniston. It is often asked by readers of the late Dr. Gibson's ramblings and ravings round the old man whether his legends are founded on fact or mere inventions of his own. That of the hermit at bank ground was based on a tradition preserved by the old statesman family there, who used to show a well which, like another between Far End and the village, had some repute as a holy well. It is likely that there was a hermit, or more than one in succession, on the spot where the Banks family afterwards made their ground. As a set-off to the rollicking nineteenth-century tale of Father Brian, I have tried to sketch the portrait of a real hermit from authentic records. In the middle of the fourteenth century, certain Yorkshire nuns wrote the life of Richard Roll of Hampole, preacher, author and hermit. They prepared it in the form of an office or service to be used in celebrating his feast day, for they hoped that the Pope would canonise him, as indeed was well deserved, for no man has ever written more nobly of the love of God and the life of the Christian than Richard Roll. He was one of those born saints who were a real blessing to their age. Whether the nun's petition never reached the Pope, or whether the devil's advocate prevailed, we know not. Richard is not on the calendar, but his life and works remain, in medieval English and medieval Latin, to show us what a real hermit might be, if we need assurance that the faith was not without witnesses in an age we call dark and erring. Fancy then for a moment that another such lived here, and that the house of Furness put in their claim for him. On this wise, in the florid Latin of their day, they would have written. Fragment from an unedited manuscript of Furness Abbey. That blessed John, who for the honeyed sweetness of his eloquence, and the golden sentences of his wisdom, might rightly be called a second Johannes Chrysostomus, was born in a certain city of the meridional parts of England. But his parents being of the north country, and loving the mountainous rudeness of this their fatherland, more than the urbane enjoyments of the south, brought him yet as a child into these regions by which habitude and early dwelling, beside the outspread waters of our lakes, and beneath the wooded rocks of remoter valleys, there was instilled into him such awe of the divine wonders of the desert wilds, which, to many another, are but a terror and a stumbling-block, that even in his infantile age he sang with rare sweetness the glories of the Creator in these his manifold and marvellous works psalm levavi oculos etc footnote these psalms and hymns are intended to be sung to enliven and vary the collation or reading of the office upon the feast day of the saint End of footnote. nor was his mind on other matters uninformed for by the industry of his parents 
he was set to learn the rudiments of worldly letters, and being proficient in Latin, was put to the University of Oxford, where he studied, not without praise and early reputation. Thereafter, voyaging in foreign parts from town to town, of Gallia and Burgundia, even unto the holy city, he sought the converse of the learned, and the study of such things as remain from ancient times, in order to perfect himself in arts and sciences, both humane and divine, and in due course being made doctor and teacher in the said university, by his eloquence, he attracted, by his exhortations improved, and by his erudition informed the studious youth who flocked to him, together with many of their elders, both in Oxford and elsewhere, in whatsoever place he appeared, another Abelardus teaching and preaching a spiritual philosophy. Footnote. The passage following is closely copied from the life of Richard, showing that it was known to the Furness scribe. End of footnote. Admirable indeed and profitable were this wonderful man's outpourings and sacred illustrations, with which he brought many a hearer out of darkness into light, and, moreover, in his mellifluous tractates and books, composed for the edification of the world, how many a period still re-echoes the sweetest harmony in the souls of those that have read with understanding, how many a word of warning still rolls its thunders in the quaking hearts of those that have heard and trembled at the storm of his righteous indignation. Here follow verses in praise of his eloquence. Now when many years had been consumed in these labours, and his bodily strength was somewhat abated, though not the fire of a spirit ever ardent after the secrets of a divine life, and the mysteries of the divine working, this blessed man, having regard to the saying of the apostle, lest when I have preached, etc., bethought himself of retirement from the world, and, quitting the scene of his triumphs, and disparting his goods among the poor, he denuded himself of gold and silver, giving to these precious stones, and to those his books and images of price, thus laying up greater and more enduring treasure in heaven. Of all rules of religion he chiefly esteemed the Cistercian, not for learning nor for power, but being led by his philosophy, not falsely so called, toward the virtue of bodily toil and the felicities of pastoral life, in which the Cistercians do exercise themselves, fulfilling the command, in the sweat of thy brow, etc. For in this rule he found rightly balanced and intermixed the contemplative with the active, and the double blessing of faith and works enjoyed. So, being come with the remnant of that he had to furness, he was received with joy, as one about to do honour to the place of his adoption with his substance and his fame, and to edify men with the example of his life and the wisdom of his teaching. Verses in praise of the Cistercian rule. Thus remaining for a space in all humility, and yet in labour abundant, it seemed that he might be chosen to high place, yea, even to end his days in the dignities of lordship and the chair of the abbot. But for our faults this was not permitted, and for his own greater glory hereafter greater things were in store for him. There is a certain piece of water within the liberties of the Lordship of St. Mary's, by name the water of Terstinus, or, in the English tongue, it is, Lithorstein's water. Around this lake stand huge and well-nigh inaccessible mountains, and especially along the oriental shores of it arise steep hills, thickly beset with ancient trees, such as oaks, beeches, hollies, and so forth. None inhabit there saving it be woodcutters and hearthmen, in the service of our Lord Abbot, for the burning of iron ore which they carry thither on the backs of horses from pits in Allen scales and Orgrave and elsewhere. But on the adverse coast lie certain houses of the tenants of St. Mary's, at a place called Lethwaite, and beyond the water of Eudalbeck is Coningston, and the hall of a good knight, father at the time of Sir John Fleming, who now holds of our Lord, Footnote. This fixes the date, for there were two Sir Johns, father and son, of whom the second died 1353. End of footnote. Else is all desert and forest land, until you come to Hawkenshevard, 
at the farther side of certain mountains. Now, with permission of our Lord, and conducted by men who knew the land, is the blessed Johann come to the water, and brought in a boat to the farthest headland of the shore, and there set down with little pomp in the thickest part of the wood, beyond that region which the colliers and workers of iron had heretofore penetrated. It was surely by some providence that he found, even in these wilds, a little hut, left by a certain woodcutter, and empty, though ruinous, and hardly keeping the rain from his body, the which, by labour being restored into some fitness of use, he inhabited, requiring little, and content with that which others scorned. More verses, so barbarous as to be untranslatable. Many are the wonderful histories yet in the mouths of all concerning the deeds of this blessed man, how he dwelt there alone, improving the solitude with heavenly converse, and wrestling with the demons which infest the darkness of the waste. For victual he had that which the wood afforded him, and the little plot of land which with his own hands, the rough growth of wildings being eradicated, he tilled and set with fruit and herbs. Moreover, they of the place, knowing that a sanctity had come upon their homes through his presence, would visit him with their little offerings of a fish or a handful of meal, and from the hither bank of the water would come in their boats the children of the neighbours dwelling at Lathwaite and round about, whom he received gladly, telling them indeed but little of that philosophy for which he had been sought, and was still famed, but things suited to their infantile understanding, as one who had learned the secrets of the world and set no store by them. For he taught them of herbs and healing things, such as he had in daily habitude before his eyes. As the scripture says, from the cedar tree, etc., and beasts and fowl and creeping things were his brethren, resorting to him, and as Adam in the paradise he welcomed them each by name, knowing well their ways and needs. Yea, even the elements were obedient to him, for there is a certain spring of water. The rest of the story is hardly decipherable. It seems to refer to the miracle by which the virtues of this holy well were established, and goes on to relate the hermit's dealings with the Fleming family, how the elder son William was struck with an incurable disease, and the daughter Joan was married to John Le Towers of Lowick, which we know happened in 1333. There is mention of two tenants of the Lowick family, Thomas Scale and Nicholas Child, and Cetera de Sunt. End of part 10 The Leaguer of Carlisle It is told in the book of the Reverend Hugh Todd, Doctor in Divinity, and some time a prebendary of Carlisle, how the Scots in the year 1382, having burnt Penrith and a part of Carlisle, were put to flight by the appearance of a great army, which was shown them by a lady, thought to be the Blessed Virgin Mary, the patroness of the city, for which cause, her impress with our Saviour in her arms, is the public seal of the corporation to this day. O oh, yonder comes a weather lamb, and yonder comes a yow, and yonder comes a young lad, and what's the tidings now? Young man, shepherd lad, whistling blithe and gay, with a white ling in thee bonnet, is it good news to-day? O oh, lasses, hearken hither, it's tidings, and it's true, doings of a lady fair that never man could do. Nay, then, shepherd lad, sit thee down and tell. A tale's a tale, he done a dale, so far beyond the fell. Ye kent the Scots were raiding? Nay, how should we be told? And Perith Castle was a low. Good Lord, they wax and bold. And when they caught till Carlisle town, they kess and fire therein. They burnt a street. Eh, lady sweet, they wrought a deadly sin. Now fair befall your faces, and fair's the word ye say, and fair is yonder lady that keeps the town to-day. Young lad, shepherd's lad, thy riddle's hard at reed. It's she that stands for merry Carlisle, and who's so good at need. It was about the gloaming, and folk were all fordone, with hungering sore and fighting hard from dawn till set a sun. The leaguer of the Scottish thieves was round about the town, 
and to-night said they or break of day yon towers shall topple down and it was about the gloaming a lady mort they spy a barn she bare on her arm so fair and softly trip she by stand they cried and yield thee now but she ever smiled the more good men i seek we your chief to speak for need is a passing sore thy errand will ye know it my errand answered she then turn ye round and gaze astound yonder on harryby and lo upon the landward edge they saw a fairly thing a grand array as clear as day and the banner of the king no more they stayed for babe nor maid when that fairly thing they spied but devil tack the hindermost was all the bravest cried and this ran and that ran through heart and heart-strings crack till esk was won and flight was done they never looked aback it was the castle warder and he looked from carlisle wall the red was on the little clouds and the night began to fall he saw the host on harryby he saw the lady speak he saw the scot flit o'er the woff like sparkles through the reek he blew a note on his bugle horn and up the newel stair who skips a main but sir captain who puffs but master mare and bells ring out and windows shine and the bishop in golden weed he cries to the folk in the minster isle our lady stands for merry carlisle and who so good at need now glows the marvel as you may or deem it all a lie but so the town was kept and saved five hundred years gone by and hardy heads of cumbrian breed and hands that loved a sword for carlyle's public seal decreed to grave in memory of the deed these whom they knew their best at need their lady and their lord end of part eleven epilogue dost thou mind when we were barns brother what holiday lakes we had when thou was nobber to lylan and i was a mandarin lad and they sent us away for a lurple set louse from two in at school for lonter in months o summer and rattle in weeks o yule eh t brex we had together and tall spots ivery yan by t side of windermere water dost thou mind them davy man for now thou's nay mare to lylan they tell ma thou's cumt on fine what coach and six horses is now tult near t electric railway line when folk cause bock o ocean and cracks o the doing with praise see happen thou's gitten o grand like at care for t ancient days but nay a lad as up owed it thou's nin sicker now to do as forgets all days old friends though it's thretty years sen by now what were rambles it coppy and larch wood were climbs it cherry tree were trots it bock lone snow and a blazon moon was he eth the neens it thlaith or to boat a sloft we chips and hammer and nails can thrive in a deck for to centre board a cut in a suit o sails and neats be a girt chap fire we darm cookin poddish and tates and old billy a spinnin his yarns while he fettled his trollin baits sick tales as he used at tell us and a many he kent dood will there was hugh to giant a trout beck and adam a rattle gill rows we scotch rebels he called em and fornus monks lang sin and to bassick boggle and to beech ill yan there was bogglesy plenty then he's gone now poor old billy and to dame and to good all folk and many's to chain sin i and ye sat under his rannel bork why as git an alder myself and it's my turn now for a yarn and we've beeth on as barns o our own and nowt caps teals for a barn if it's no but an ald hair reap will ye tack it wi love fra heem for it's twine don't seem ald creeks and a deal at stuff's the same if it's telt in a heemly way as tall folk used at crack then read it as thou knars how thou's seen fin trick go back appen it's fond but i'm fain at a reet warm spot sud bide 
Its brust are thy barns for a hame on round world riper side. Its grand wet southern cross leats up their sky of a low. Yet twain rolls round where northern fells in a land a long ago. It's bonny their garden bower of a summery Christmas day. But ye were young where its sweet gale grows, see far and far away. End of part twelve. End of Coniston Tales by W. G. Collingwood. Read by Phil Benson in Sydney, Australia.